this bring division. So we divide up the reading stamp. After a scripture like this, I have to tell you, it just really breaks my heart to say good the gospel of the Lord, because that literally is good news. What is good news about Jesus saying I've come to divide families? It doesn't, doesn't sound good, and yet kind of ripped from the headlines, the media, the news feed. Families divided against each other. I don't know about you, but there are relatives with whom I carefully avoid any number of topics. <laughs> and as I reflected on this whole matter of division in families, what it made me confront was my own upbringing. In that, we were nice people. Now, I was raised in another tradition, not Episcopalian, but I understand that some of this went on in the Episcopal Church as well. We were raised to be nice. We were also raised to ignore the occurring world. We did not talk about sex, politics, or religion. Nice people did not have problems, and they didn't talk about them. So I grew up in a bubble, we could say, and managed to be pretty much oblivious to most of what was going on in the 60s and the 70s. My husband helped me open up to a number of things since he had served gladly and uh, usefully in Vietnam. But still, I realized as I was reflecting on the passage how much of it just went right past the side of my head. When I joined the Episcopal Church and was called to the priesthood, it was absolutely fascinating to realize that I was exactly what the Standing Committee and the Commission on Ministry was looking for. I was a nice lady, I had a stable marriage, and I had a child. And I was interested in doing the work that was called, I was called to do. What more could you ask? And yet, I think Jesus is pointing to what is asked of us over and over again. Not going to war with our families. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think the point he's making is that our call is not a comfortable one. And I tell you, I've lost count of the number of conversations I have had with individuals complaining about, you know, the state of the world, the state of their family, their children, whatever, as though if they were doing it right. This wouldn't be happening. And I say to them, excuse me, we are not following somebody who died on a sleep number mattress. <laughs> he died on a cross. He died in agony. Most of us will never endure that kind of agony. Most of us will never endure that kind of humiliation or shame. Most of us. Especially if you've been as siloed as I've been. So, what does that work? What are we to do then with this gospel? I don't, I don't see. I don't think he's calling us to rise up and smite one another. I just don't get that. What I get is that he understands he has a work to do, and it's burning him up. He's got to do this thing. And the work he's got to do is to take on the fallenness of humanity, willingly, openly. The Buddhists consider Jesus one of the master practitioners of a work called Tongva. Tongva literally translated understand means take and give. And if you're doing Tongva, you, and you notice that you have something going on with you, anger, hatred, uh, contempt, you breathe in all of the anger or hatred or contempt or whatever thing is lacerating your soul. You breathe that in, and then you breathe out some antidote, some joy or peace or 
whatever whatever comes to you to, to breathe out. So Jesus in going to the cross, Jesus was making the supreme taking from giving. He was taking all the fallenness of humanity and giving the power of God in the resurrection. So for me, that's the work that we're being called to do. Maybe it doesn't line up exactly with what we heard in the gospel text, but I think that's the work. The present time, ours, 2022, is as fallen and distraught maybe more than ever. At any time in human history, actually I'm persuaded, and I haven't talked to a historian about this, but I'm persuaded we may be living through one of the most terrifying periods in human history. We are confronted daily with the impact of accelerating change, accelerating change in technology, in the climate, and in globalization. Things are happening on our video screens around the planet. On the other side of the world, we say nothing of the Chautauqua and the attack on Salman Rushdie. Things are happening that human beings didn't know about before. We're understanding the political tensions and difficulties engaged in the contest between China and Taiwan. There are things that are unfolding that, I don't know about you, but I grew up pretty much oblivious to. And I think it is not an unnatural human response to be frightened, to be very frightened. The thing about fear is that it contributes nothing. It contributes nothing. One of the great privileges in my life was to serve as an alcohol and drug treatment chaplain for four years. And they taught me a marvelous, marvelous thing. That fear <coughs> is an acronym. False expectations appearing real. Fear. False expectations appearing real. So that a call, I believe, in our day and time, is to embrace the fire of God which lights up the world. It can, if we will, light us up. It can, if we will, open us up to possibilities that we don't now imagine. Because my experience of fear, I don't know about yours, but check it out, is when I'm afraid, I close in. I just curl up like a was a little snail with salt on it. Come on. And the invitation of this God, the one that Jesus manifests in incarnate form, the invitation of this God is to open up, to reach out, to be in conversation. So, my invitation to each and every one of us is that we use the events of the coming week, God help us they be less dramatic than the last few weeks, that we use the events of the coming week as an opportunity not to close down or be afraid or enraged about it. They would only see the light or do it the way I say or whatever, but rather to open up, to be open to possibilities, be open to God, active and present in ways you can't understand, and certainly never could have arranged. Because it is that willingness to be converted, that willingness to be converted that lets love loose. It is our openness to one another that lets love be active and present. 
So that's my prayer for us as we make our way into this next week after Pentecost. I don't know if I've given you my theory of church calendar. My theory is that from the first advent to the uh, first advent to hello. Oh, yeah, that's right. Thank you. First, from first advent to the Feast of Pentecost. I was trying to say Feast of Christ came here, that wasn't right. So first advent to Pentecost. The church is giving us the story that gives us life, is letting us breathe in broad, inspiring stories of that great crowd of witnesses that Paul refers to in Hebrews so eloquently. So we're taking all that in. And then I say, the invitation of the church is to use the Sundays, for Sunday after Pentecost, Trinity Sunday, to last Sunday after Pentecost. We call it the Feast of the Realm of God or Christ the King. Use those to bring down the story. How are we going to live out what we've been taking in? How are we being called to do that? And I don't know about you, but I always thought it was some sort of heroic something or other. I should be, you know, serving here or serving there or, you know, if if I were deploying me, I would have done, you know, we'd call it deploying. <laughs> I'll give you an example. I speak Spanish fluently. All the opportunities that I saw and told my bishop about where I could serve a Hispanic congregation, no. That was not the work I was to do. So what we think our agenda, our plan, our point of view is fine, and God's glad to hear about that. But God may have something much greater in mind for you. Irish Catholic little girls did not dream of serving in the Episcopal Church or in the, in the Diocese of Western Michigan. Doesn't, doesn't occur. So, that's my invitation, my prayer for each and every one of us, that we find ourselves opening up, not to our plan, not to our agenda, not to our shoulda, woulda, coulda, but to what's unfolding in love. What the invitation is for the world that you are encountering, that you are witnessing, and bearing witness to. That is my prayer for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.